I see it. This is quite a. Oh, for uh, coming out. Quite the scene. Let me go here. So you know, in in America, where we've both just come from, we have Silicon Valley. In New York, we have Silicon Alley. They talk about the Silicon Prairie somewhere in Colorado. Should we call this the Silicon Danube? The Silicon Palace? I mean, this is quite an impressive gathering it here. It is, it is Silicon Palace, yeah. This is very cool. We don't have stuff like this uh, back home. No, but we do have, you know, we, we did start up a country a couple hundred years ago that is, that is still alive. There's more history here. Uh, I wanted to ask you, because Phil, you talk about wanting to create a hundred year company. Uh, you're in your early 40s, and obviously you will probably not be around to see it, but why is it important to have that time, uh, sort of a 10-decade horizon, even though you're only five or six years old? You know, I don't know why you're just assuming that I'm not going to be around in 100 years. I mean, I would only be, I'd only be 141, and uh, you know, there's, there's some, some chance, some chance. But I probably won't be the CEO yeah. of the company anymore, um, but you know, I, still, I still hope to be involved in some, in, in some way. Is my audio okay? Can you guys hear me? You guys hearing him okay? How about now? Is that better? <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, we... Let's see what's actually going on here. All right, I'll switch to this if I have to. But this looks okay. All right, now we do it this way. I try to avoid having the handheld mic because I'm not coordinated enough to hold a microphone in my hand. Uh, but I'll try. So, you know, Evernote has a sort of mildly ambitious, it's to help the world remember everything, communicate effectively, and get things done. Um, you started as basically an app, and we, we talk about this idea of people starting up, make something cool, and then worry you know, get people using it and then worry about the revenues later. Is that a way to approach this business? Well, so our idea was very specific at Evernote. Uh, what, by the time we started Evernote, um, it was already my third startup. And uh, a few other people in the company had either been with me for the previous couple of startups or had, had startups on their own. So we came at it with the experience of already having started and sold other companies. Uh, and we just wanted to build something for ourselves. So our primary motivation was, you know, we knew how much work it was to make a company, and we didn't want to make a company just so that we could sell it again. We wanted to make something that was sufficiently epic that we could make our lives work. Um, and everything kind of came from there. The 100-year idea came from there. We said we want to make a 100-year startup. You know, we want to make a company that still exists in 100 years, but more than that, that it's actually still a startup, it's still innovating, it's still making good decisions. Uh, but most importantly, we just only wanted to make products for ourselves that we loved. We didn't want to ask, you know, what does the market want? We just wanted things for ourselves. Um, and uh, it isn't so much that we said, well, we'll worry about the revenue later. It's that we said we, we, have a, we want to have a long-term greedy business model where we want to be able to optimize how much money we make over the course of the 100 years. Uh, and we're ready to give up short-term revenue so that we can get more long-term revenue. Okay, now talk to me a little bit about that business model. You're up to about 75 million users. Yeah, uh, a little over 80 now. And I think people often, when they're talking to angel investors or venture investors or the press, they talk about, you know, we're either business to consumer or we're business to business over here, and B2C means revenues come from advertising and we're not sure what. B2B means you have paying customers with accounts. How does Evernote approach that? It seems like you started out B2C, but are now B2B or have some combination, or is that no longer a useful frame for thinking about the internet industry? So I think it's becoming less and less of a useful frame for thinking about it. I think there's a different division which makes more sense for me. For us, um, being a consumer business or being an enterprise business is actually the same thing, because for, for Evernote, it's the same human beings, it's the same people. Uh, we target the modern knowledge worker, we're trying to make uh, the indispensable set of products for the modern knowledge worker. And so when we say modern knowledge worker, we mean me, and we mean you, and we mean probably most people in this audience. 
And we want to have a, a lifelong relationship with these people independent of whether we're talking to them individually or we're talking to them in their company or whatever. So we have a consumer product and a business product, but it's really the same product that's used by the same people. Uh, and so the two build each other really, really nicely. What we reject are indirect sources of revenue. So for us, the distinction is not business and consumer, it's direct versus indirect. Okay. All of our revenue is direct, which means we only make money by giving our customers a product that they want to pay for. And we don't make any money on advertising, on data mining. You know, we're not a big data play. We don't try to, we don't try to be clever with your data. Everything you put into Evernote is private. Um, I think that's a more meaningful distinction, okay. is direct but versus indirect. Given the fact that when, when you have companies that have millions of users and you are inevitably gathering a large amount of data about their interests and what they do, is that something you have to sort of consciously resist in saying, we're not going to try to make something of it? Because it seems like for so many other companies, that's one of the great things about having so many customer relationships. Yeah, um, we explicitly uh, say, we, we published our three laws of data protection uh, years ago, and this is the, f the foundational principles of the company, and it's basically your data is yours, so you own your data, we don't own it. Uh, your data is protected and your data is portable, and so we explicitly say that we are not a big data company, we won't make money that way. Uh, and uh, you know, the more you say it and the more you say it publicly, the more it becomes a real thing. So yeah, we absolutely have to, have to reject that. Not that there's anything inherently wrong with it, it's just it's a very different business model. We're trying to optimize for trust for 100 years. And I think whenever you have a business model that's indirect, that's based on uh, people use your product, but you don't make money from the people using the product, you make money because of those people in some indirect way, it sets up a potential conflict of interest, which you can make a lot of money early on, but it's hard to sustain that for 100 years. So we do explicitly reject that. Now, in my me uh, industry, the media, everyone has some form of a freemium model where letting people use it for free to some degree, and then you try to get them and hope that they will eventually pay for it. It seems like what you're doing here, but can you give us some uh, either insight onto either some of the metrics and what percentage of the people are actually paying, how you go about converting them, uh, do you sort of let that happen organically, or is there a strategy to sort of, okay, we've got somebody using Evernote, now here's how we're gonna get them to pay? Yeah, um, so we have three revenue models now, um, and they're all direct, and one of them is freemium, which is the consumer one. So that's where we started, that was kind of what we became well known for, and it works great, and that's the idea there is we have a, a free version of Evernote, and the goal of the free version is not to get you to pay. The goal of the free version is to get you to hopefully use it forever, for the rest of your life, and to keep you coming back. Because every month that you keep coming back, our stats show that you're much more likely to pay for it. Um, so our conversion rates do this really interesting thing, and we've got five years of data on this now. Our conversion rates go up linearly with the time that you spent using the system. So uh, in the first month, only one half of 1% of everyone who signs up to Evernote pays in their first month. But after a year, it's up to about 6%. And after two years, it's about 11%. And our oldest users, the ones that have been with us for five years, are more than 26% paying. But is that because are they getting cut off after a certain, are they presented with, okay, you've been doing this for a year, now pay or else don't use it? There's no, uh, there's no paywall. There's no, there's no limit that you hit um, that forces you to pay. We want the perceived value of Evernote to increase. And I think this is the key for why it works well for us, but it doesn't work well for other types of companies. Um, freemium works really well if the perceived value of your product keeps increasing the longer you use it. Uh, m the vast majority of products behave the opposite way. The vast majority of products, the, your highest perceived value is right at the beginning. So like, you know, if I buy a hamburger, my greatest value is right when I'm eating it, and then I don't get value afterwards. I would say with like McDonald's, it's actually a negative value afterwards because your self-esteem goes down. I, you know, I, I like McDonald's hamburgers, but that's, that's just me. Uh, but I have a broad, broad taste in all sorts of different types of food. Uh, but you can't run a freemium hamburger business because the greatest perceived value is up front. Right. Uh, for your business, the perceived value stays constant. So it, you know, if I subscribe, I'm getting a certain amount of value each month, but it stays constant. For Evernote, because it's your life, your perceived value goes up. And since the perceived value goes up the longer you use it, if we keep you coming back, it's gonna be worth more and more and more, and so you, more and more people convert, and we just see that directly. So what percent of your users are actually paying on well, any given day? Um, if you take the overall percentage, currently it's probably about 5%, but that overall percentage doesn't really matter much. What really matters is what percentage 
pay by what's called cohort age. So what percentage of the people in their first month pay? Right. What percentage of the people in their first year pay? What percentage of the people in their second year pay? And that keeps increasing. So of the people who have been with Evernote the longest, 26% of them are paying this month uh, and, and so on. And that just gets better with time. Now, your revenues have not been, are generally not made public, but your fundraising has been a matter of public record and you've had several rounds of venture capital funding uh, can you just tell me about, I think, sort of the last two and what the purposes were? Did, were they needed for, hey, we need more cash to invest to keep the lights on, or was it we want to get some money in so we could get some money out to some of our early investors? Uh, when you've been around and you have this many users and you seem to be generating cash, what is the point of having successive rounds of venture funding? Well, um, it's really this whole 100-year plan. So we're very serious about this 100-year idea. Uh, and in order to be a 100-year company and to be a, an independent 100-year company, uh, at some point we have to go public. And I see, you know, I see going public as a, as a moral obligation. It's something that you know, we need to get to. Uh, but the way to really manage that is to separate out liquidity from exit. Um, the, the number one mistake that I think uh, a lot of startup entrepreneurs make, and the same mistake that I made my first two times, and it took me until my third company to figure this out, is that you shouldn't have an exit strategy. Like, if you have an exit strategy, that means what you're working on is insufficiently epic. Like, if you're, if you're working on something that you love that's sufficiently epic, that's your life's work, you don't need an exit strategy. You don't need an exit strategy for your life's work. So the whole point of Evernote is no exit strategy, which means you have to separate exit from liquidity. You should call it Sartre Note. <laughs> yes, exactly. Very nice. <laughs> that'll, that'll, that'll work but well in Europe. You couldn't, make, you couldn't make that joke back no. in the U.S. But doesn't this fly in the face of a first, our sort of culture in the U.S. where if you don't have returns within 12 months, you're a chump, but B, this whole machinery, the venture capital funds, the endowments who are investing in them, the exchanges, the media, that are, and, and the workers themselves who are expecting that you know, if you don't sell out, right. I mean, that, that's, selling out is the measure of success. It, it's not. It's, um, it's not in Silicon Valley, not anymore. Uh, it changed pretty quickly. So, so you do give liquidity points. So back to your question, the reason we raise money is most of the rounds we raised had a primary component and a secondary component. Okay. The primary component goes to the company, and we use that basically to build up a buffer so that we can isolate ourselves from the macroeconomic conditions. Because I don't, I don't want to have to worry about, you know, how's the economy doing this quarter? I just want to be able to focus for years building a great product. But some of the money goes to, to pay out existing shareholders. So early investors, angel investors, employees, founders, all get to sell a little bit. Uh, so we want to have people involved in Evernote should be making money all the way through, should have liquidity all the way through, so that there is no giant single event. So no one is sitting around waiting, being incented to sell the company just because that's the only way they can make any money. We want people to be able to sell a little bit, you know, every year or so. And based on, you know, we've seen some very high profile IPOs, Facebook, obviously, we're all anticipating Twitter. Um, you've been around this culture. Is there something that either goes wrong or changes the nature of the company once it's public that people should be sort of leery of? Well, I've, I've never run a public company, so I, I'm not, I don't know exactly. Um, my feeling is that uh, there's way too much attention to the IPO itself. Like that's, that's just a, a fixation of the, of uh, uh, kind of the popular press. Um, the IPO ought to be a non-event. Uh, it ought to be purely a legal transaction where not, it's not that interesting. Like, I would like to see a day where IPOs of companies just aren't that big a deal. It's just another piece of paper you file. It doesn't even change your investors very much anymore because for, for most of these companies, tech companies that are going public now, including for Evernote by the time we're ready to do it, most of our investors will stay the same because we're already getting investment from the types of companies, you know, large funds that, that, that invest in public companies. So it literally is just a transition of the form of the company. It should be, boring, it should be a boring non-story. The story ought to be the company itself and its long-term you know, model. Um, but, I, but I think that just hasn't been the focus. I think it's more interesting to, to kind of really okay. focus on the IPO as a dramatic, you know, as a dramatic event. But a successful IPO, almost by definition, shouldn't be dramatic. It should just be another day. Company structure of the company changes, but then you keep going on to, to build great things. Uh, we don't have too much time. I want to ask you a little bit about Evernote's corporate culture. And I think, again, we're in this world where 
every internet company, it's almost sort of, if you go to New York or Silicon Valley, it's almost a cliche. They all, you know, the beanbag chairs and the, the free food, um, the cafeterias at Google, right? It's it sort of established the things you're supposed to do. And, but you guys have some unique aspects. Um, one of them is a sort of flatness in the, in the corporate structure. Um, open seating plan, unlimited vacations. Are you taking applications right now? Because unlimited vacation seems pretty good to me. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, and we are taking applications right now uh, all across the world. We're hiring in, in every office. Uh, but I would never hire someone who wants to work with us for the unlimited vacation. <laughs> um, uh, or for the, you know, the, free, the free house cleaning or the you know, free electric cars that we give to people in California. Uh, they're not perks. Do you give free Teslas? No, but okay. uh, your Tesla's about half off if you work at Evernote, okay. so you can get it for about half price. Um, uh, but these aren't perks, right? So these aren't ways to attract people. In fact, they're kind of the opposite. I almost wish that people didn't know about them, because the last thing I want is people applying because they want, you know, the car or something. These are things that once you are, you know, it should be very difficult to get a job at Evernote. It should be very difficult to keep a job at Evernote. But once you're there, you're there because you want to work hard, you want to be productive, and then it's our responsibility to remove all of the obstacles to productivity. So if we can, you know, if we can save you an hour a day of traffic, it's worth it for right. us to do that. Uh, the vacation policy works the same way, and that's not unique. There's lots of companies that have unlimited vacations. Uh, I think Netflix really, really got it started. But the idea there is like, look, um, being in the office is not punishment. It's not a prison. Like, you don't come to the office out of a punishment. So if being in the office is not punishment, why should counting how many days you're allowed to be outside of the office be a reward? Like everyone that works for us is an adult. Uh, they all want to work, they want to be productive, so why should we care how much vacation you take? You, you, that's up to you to figure out. Now that sounds great, and it also sounds relatively easy to manage if you are, have 25 people or 30 people, you have a defined number of things going on, you're all working in the same place, you literally know everybody and who they are and how they work. But, you're a much bigger organization now. How, how many different offices do you have? How many people do you have in total? We have about 350 people and maybe nine offices. Um, it's not that big yet. But I mean, but, Netflix does this with thousands of people. Right, but I guess the question is, this culture, as you expand and start setting up operations in different cities, in different countries, different time zones, does that mean you, you personally have to spend more time working on the culture, or do you sort of hand that off to say, you're the, you know, you're the chief culture officer, you just make sure that as we're setting up in Zurich and Texas and everywhere else, it's just like it is here. No, the culture is the most important part of my job, and at some point, it becomes the only part of my job. I think if you, if you measure this over the lifetime of the company, the culture is the only thing. Like, the culture is more important than the product, um, because the product is the current product, the culture is what makes the next 100 products. So this, this is the only thing that a CEO really needs to be doing. This is, this is the main part of the job. So there is, no, there is no chief culture officer. I mean, that's me. In fact, I would hand off virtually everything else before I, before I gave up uh, what the culture should be. And, and the way to think about it is um, I used to really spend a lot of time worrying about this. I used to say, like, well, this is, the startup culture is easy when you're small. And so I have to fight to preserve it. I have to really fight to make sure the culture doesn't change as we get bigger. But then I realized through some advice from much better CEOs than I am that this is actually a stupid way to think about it. It's impossible to preserve any culture. If I try to preserve it, if I try to lock it in place, it's just gonna get stagnant, it's gonna crack. Really, I have to, my job as the CEO is to intentionally decide how I want the culture to change. And instead of letting it change by accident, instead of just saying, oh, we got big, I guess now we're stupid. I have to intentionally decide how I want it to change, and then I have to, I have to change it. And that is, that's the main job. That's, that's what I spend most of my time on. Now, speaking of culture, I think there's a tendency for Americans to be sort of slightly chauvinistic about our ability to create these global companies that, you know, we sort of invented the internet, invented it as a business, and we have this whole machinery from, you know, Stanford, Silicon Valley, NASDAQ, this whole thing that sort of feeds upon itself and that other places in the world are not quite uh, up to our speed. Well, here we are in the center of Europe in an imperial palace, uh, and I think, I think Americans, if you ask them typically about European startup culture, would not know an awful lot about it, but you're over here a fair amount. How would you characterize what is going on here 
where it is in relation uh, to the U.S.? Um, I think there's I think in, there's many strengths here that we that we don't have in the U.S. Uh, you know, and vice versa. So at Evernote, we set out right from the beginning to be global. Uh, and when we say global, we mean we don't really care where we sell things because you can sell things everywhere in the world now. You don't really there's not very many restrictions. We want to make a set of products that are globally great. So the design of our products, the goal is to make them so good that people love them everywhere in the world the same way. Uh, we don't want to have to have differences in our product for different countries. Evernote in China is almost exactly the same as Evernote in Brazil and Evernote in Europe and Evernote in the US and all of our products are. And the way we do that is we design them everywhere. So the reason we have all these offices in different, in different countries is, be, is not because we want to sell there. Uh, it's because we want to get the very best designers and engineers and partners to help us make something that's globally great. You know, when Apple says designed in California, um, we don't know how to do that. Like, we're not smart enough to sit in California and design products for the whole world. We need to be everywhere and design products for the whole world. So I think, the, I think uh, Europe has a huge amount to offer, particularly in the design culture, which is becoming the single most important thing for products, period. And I, I think there's many parts of Europe that are on the, it feels like they're on the verge of a, uh, an entrepreneurial renaissance uh, in startups. Well, speaking of entrepreneurial renaissance, I think part of the idea of pioneers is to have this sort of interaction between people who are starting up and people who are a little more established. So I'd like to invite out two uh, young European entrepreneurs, Luca Baskin from Logo Grab, which is a company that uh, will link content to your logo, and Sylvie Chin of Clear Karma, a French company that makes interactive food labeling. I'd like to invite them both out to, uh, to the stage now. Great. Hey. Nice to see you. Great to see you again. You guys want to move over this way? You Why don't you two sit up. over there, and I'll get, I, I'm going to turn over the mic. You're, you're going to disintermediate me. Uh-oh. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Hello. And uh, hello. Um, I'm Sylvie Chin, the founder of Clear Karma. We are the interactive food labeling for restaurants and catering companies. And I'm very thrilled to meet you today and have a nice chat with you because we also have a global product which we also um, will uh, launch with verticals. So that's why I'm quite interested in knowing your ideas about that, but I'll go more in details afterwards with that. First of all, my question is that um, like two weeks ago, I met Ben Rooney from uh, the New York Times who interviewed you already. And he told me, you're gonna have so much fun with Phil because he's such a nice person and I want to know your secret of being such a nice person. <laughs> well, it takes many years of practice to <laughs> pretend to be a nice person uh, to the media. You just have to work at it and work at it and practice in front of the camera and say, no, it's still, I'm not convincing enough and yeah. Okay, I'll pass on to Luca. Hi, Phil. I have a question that I think most of us uh, have for you, uh, which is how did you manage to scale uh, such a grassroots idea of uh, uh, taking notes uh, uh, and staying ahead of competition in such a uh, competitive landscape? Uh, well, so that's, that's a really great question. So we had, um, um, we had the world's worst VC pitch, by the way, when we were starting out. Um, our first VC pitch was, uh, I'd go in and I'd say, uh, I'd say, hi, um, you know, I'm Phil Libin, you've never heard of me. Uh, we're going to make this product called Evernote and it's going to let you, you know, write things down using your computer <laughs> and uh, we're going to give it away for free. Can I have $10 million, please? Um, and it didn't work, I would get kicked out. But usually right before I got kicked out, they would ask me, well, who's your competition? And then it got even better, because I would say, well, uh, you know, every single computer or phone or PDA or device that's ever been released in the past 50 years already has a free note-taking program on it that's pretty good. So we kind of have infinite competition right away. Um, and that wasn't a very good answer either. Uh, but we never thought about the competition. Like, we literally never paid attention, and we still don't. Not because the competition is not important, but because worrying about what other people are doing doesn't help you because it doesn't make your own product better. And your only shot of succeeding is to make your own product as good as possible. So it's, it's almost completely irrelevant what anyone else is doing. Um, and all we did is we built for ourselves. 
passion and gut feeling, I would say, probably. Yeah. Uh, we, we only build things that we wanted to use. And this gave us an advantage because since we built it for ourselves, we were good judges of when it was good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and because of the way the world is set up right now, because of app stores and, uh, and social media and, and you know, smartphones, if you make something for yourself, uh, if you make something that you really love, there's going to be another 100 million people or maybe a billion people somewhere in the world that also really love it because they have similar tastes than yours. Correct. And they're going to be able to find it and get it and know about it immediately you know, and use it. So I would say five years ago, it would have been very bad advice to, to say to a startup entrepreneur, just build something for yourself. Um, but I think right now it's, it's, it's the right advice. So that's, that's what we did and uh, it just, it was, it was it, we're off to a good start because we found another 80 million people so far in the world that love the same things we love. And I think there's another billion out there as well. Super. I agree. I agree. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Now I have the questions that I wanted to ask from the very beginning. So what are your learnings with going into verticals like the Evernote food, for instance? Um, well, you know, we, we, we experimented a lot with, and still experiment with a lot of different stuff. Uh, so, and, and this, that's probably the most important thing, is just to, to understand that everything is worth experimenting. Like anything, you're probably wrong about everything that you think you're right about, and it's just, it's worth experimenting. So, uh, a couple of years ago, we said, what's the right number of apps to have? And nobody knows the answer to this. You know, are you better off having just one app uh, so that you can drive all the people to download one thing and you go up in the ratings and app stores? Or are you better off having multiple apps because every time you have an app, you can get featured and you have you know, a bigger footprint? And how many is too many? And so we just experimented with that. And so we came out with a few different apps. And we settled on having roughly two to three different, different apps on each major app store. Seems to be the right number for us. Uh, but that, that came out as a result of a lot of experimentation. We don't really think of things as verticals. Like we don't think of food as a vertical product. Like a, I think of a vertical product as if we were going to make you know, Evernote for dentists. Like that would be a vertical product. Um, everyone loves food. Everyone loves to eat. I really see food as, as, as a very generalist idea. In fact, it may be more general than just Evernote in general. Like keeping track of your great food experiences to me seemed like a better general purpose, mainstream user idea than just re remembering things in Evernote. So we did it as a way to try to get different kinds of users. Uh, and it works pretty well. Um, of course, our latest experiments are much crazier, which is where we launched the Evernote market. So now we're actually making you know, physical products. We're making you know, scanners and bags and socks and iPad styluses and stuff like that. Uh, that, was, that was kind of the craziest part of the experiment. I think nobody expected that to actually, no one expected us to launch that when we did. But that's been going really well. It's only been about a month and it's, you know, it's been fantastic. So I think you just keep experimenting and the stuff that doesn't work uh, you know, kill it. And the stuff that works, you just invest more into it. Okay, thank you. Okay, my question is for us guys in the startup world. Uh, um, one of the problems we have compared to large corporations, uh, uh, we just have a few employees, uh, but we have tons of ideas and really little resources. So I was wondering if you think that Evernote could be a tool also uh, to help startups uh, to discover those uh, ideas, perhaps, uh, uh, that would be most influential and beneficial for the growth of the startup? Yeah, you know, that, that's, that's a really good question. So um, the, my main task for the first, I would say, year and a half at Evernote, literally, like the thing that I spent most of my time on was telling people to shut up and stop thinking of like clever things and just get back to work. Like the biggest obstacle we had you know, when we had our first 20 employees, we had 20 brilliant people yeah. and 20 brilliant startup people who love coming up with ideas. And that was the most harmful thing in the world because you just, you, you, you don't have time. And everyone wants to come up with new ideas and no one actually wants to finish the, you know, the idea from three weeks ago. Uh, and I really think that as a startup, it is not your job to innovate at all on anything other than like your main product. Yeah. Like the main idea that you have, you need to innovate, but everything else you should try to do as conventionally as possible because you just you don't have the resources to innovate. I think bigger companies actually produce a lot more, a lot more tangential innovation because they've got the resources to you yeah. know to 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 spend on them. But the hardest thing early on is just to um, you know to get rid of ideas, not to do them. Uh, and 
I can never lecture somebody on focusing because I think if you look at what Evernote is doing now and how many products we have, like obviously no one's going to believe me if I sit down and say you have to focus on one thing, young man, because we do like 20 things and it works well for us. But we do 20 things, where we, we're, but, but we have 10,000 ideas. <laughs> so getting it yeah. from 10,000 to 20 <laughs> is a type of focus, but it's tough. And yeah, we absolutely use Evernote for it. So we run the whole company in Evernote, and particularly Evernote Business. Uh, and the main thing about Evernote Business that works with us is, with Evernote Business, um, I automatically know what other people are working on, because mm -hmm. whenever I'm working on something in Evernote, cool. it shows me if any of my coworkers are working on similar things. Yeah. And that's actually a great way, like now that we're, you know, when we were 20, 30 people, I just knew what everyone was working on. Like, like you said, you just kind of know as a startup. But now at 350 people, I don't know what everyone is working on. But when I'm working on something, I automatically see if other people are working on the same thing because of the way Evernote business works. And that's super efficient. Like, I get a much big, better sense that even at 350 people, I still know what people are working on and we can still make sure we're not wasting too much time duplicating effort and, and try to come up with what the good ideas are. So we should go for the Evernote business. Probably yeah. would help, I would say. Uh, I, I think it would be a, we build it to be great for, for us and for startups. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I would Super. encourage people to use it and to, uh, to give us feedback on how to make it better specifically for that, for that cause. We always want to hear about it. We'll do that. OK. Well, my question would be to know what's the outlook. What's the outlook? How do you want to disrupt? go on disrupting the tech industry with uh, Evernote, and also then, uh, what do you do for the world? What's your vision also for, the, for a better world through Evernote? Ah, well, uh, so I don't, you know, I actually think disruption is really overrated. Yeah. Um, I think there's this, there's this fixation on disruption with entrepreneurship. Uh, in fact, like almost the idea is if, as if disruption is the goal, but disruption isn't the goal of, of, of entrepreneurship. I think disruption is a side effect. Um, and it's maybe an inevitable side effect, but it isn't, it isn't something that you're after. Uh, in fact, the, um, this all comes from, from a zero sum of thinking about business, which is probably the, the thing that is the biggest mistake that people make in their thinking, is um, when you hear people talk about startups and about business, and especially when, you're, when you read about it in the press, most often you're using sports analogy, so it's zero sum analogy. So you talk about business as if it was a sport, as if you were like playing baseball. You know, where there's a certain, like if somebody wins, somebody else loses, like a boxing match. Um, and, and the whole disruption idea comes from that. Uh, I don't think having a startup is like playing baseball. I think having a startup is more like playing in an orchestra. It's non-zero sum. So there's, there's other actors and there's a lot of competition, but the competition isn't zero sum. The competition makes everyone better. Uh, so if you think about if you think about being an entrepreneur more like being a musician or being a, a writer, I think it's a healthier way to look at it. And so the value that you create in a successful company is far bigger than the value that you take away from somebody else or that you disrupt. Like the value that Facebook created is much bigger than the value that they took away from MySpace. Right? Like MySpace went from you know, a billion dollars in market cap to you know, less than that, but Facebook created far more than a billion dollars in, in, in value. You know, the value that uh, Henry Ford created, you know, when he made, you know, mainstream cars is much more than the value that he took away from, you know, the horse industry. Um, so I really advise people not to think about disruption. I think if you focus on what you're going to disrupt, like, that's a weird, you're kind of starting backwards. Like, think about how am I going to create massive new value? How am I going to partner with other companies and other people to make something that doesn't exist? And, you know, you disrupt something, you disrupt something. But that... That, that's almost a side effect. And if you're successful, your disruption is going to be very minor in scale compared to, to how much you create. In terms of, 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 of what the world should be, yeah, well, I have a very specific idea about it. Um, the goal of Evernote is to make the world a little bit smarter, one person at a time. So I think a big problem with the world is people are making bad decisions all the time because of a lack of information, because of other things. And we want people to make slightly better decisions because they're using Evernote. And you know, when you have a, a billion people making slightly better decisions, you'll get a smarter world with less, less ambient stupidity. You know, I kind of want to reduce the amount of ambient stupidity in the world uh, every day, you know, very directly. That's, that's, a, that's my mission. And I think that mission is sufficiently epic to make it my life's work. Like, that's all I ever want to do in my life. 
and I would be perfectly happy if this is what I got to do and I didn't have to do anything else and there's no exit strategy and I don't want to sell. I just want to make the world a little bit smarter, you know, one person at a time. Well, Phil, since uh, I'm a journalist, I can't help but use sports analogies. We're now in injury time, extra time. If I go on too much longer, someone's going to show me a red card and I'll be suspended for another game. But I, I don't understand any of those words, but... They're all soccer say. analogies. Um, but would, I, I know it's a surprise to people looking at me, but I'm not actually an athlete. <laughs> and, uh, I'm, a, I'm a dedicated endorsement. Do you I don't, you I don't competed really like... in the computer science Olympiad? I... The Bronx science? <laughs> yeah. I, I did want to reclaim the last question, which is I think this is something that anyone dealing with a startup has to deal with. We hear a lot from, from billionaires and people who run very successful companies about failure. You know, if you're not failing, you're not trying. Uh, you should fail faster in order to succeed. You shouldn't be afraid of failure. And it's very easy for them to say, uh, you know, they have a portfolio of $500 million in municipal bonds and, and they and their children may never have to work. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about failure, the importance of failure, and sort of what you mean when you talk about it. Is it a product not catching on? Is it a business model not working? What levels of failure are sort of tolerable and encouraged at Evernote? Um, well, I think, I mean, I guess first of all, it's important to say that entrepreneurship, like starting a company, is a spectacularly bad idea for the vast majority of people who would want to do it, right? So, like, advice for us isn't mainstream advice. Like, I got into trouble a, a few days ago, I said on stage somewhere, I was joking, I said, uh, uh, don't even bother making friends with people that you don't want to start a company with. And people on Twitter are explaining, like, oh, that's terrible advice. I'm like, yeah, of course it's terrible advice. I'm not, it's not meant to be advice for you. Right. It's meant to be advice if you're the kind of crazy person that's actually going to start a company. Um, so if you're going to start a company, you're already in the tiny minority of people. And most people just shouldn't even be listening to anything I'm saying. They should just be leading their lives and focusing on their family or whatever. Uh, and that's fine. Um, but if you're if you've got the drive and the talent and the energy and you know, you're willing to work super hard, you've, you've got that kind of personality, then I think the only failure is, is squandering that. Like true failure is having the opportunity and the ability to try to make something great and then not trying. Like that's failure. Failure is if you know, somebody gave you your life and your abilities and your place in the world and you blew it because you didn't even attempt to make something better. That's failure, so don't do that. Anything other than that, as long as you've tried, that's not failure. That's doing something great, that's trying, that's learning. Even if you fail at doing something, you'll learn something, the next person will learn something. If you fail the same way three or four times, then you're just not demonstrating learning behavior and then right. you should be ashamed of yourself. But as long as you fail in new and interesting ways each time, that's great. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with it and it ought to be encouraged. And that's, I think, one thing that we, we, we in Silicon Valley and in the U.S. actually do really well. I think the we, U.S. We're really good at failing. Yeah, no, we, well, we have a really healthy attitude I towards failure. That. In many other countries, uh, in Europe, it's, it's not as healthy an attitude towards failure. In Asia, typically, it's much worse, you know, even than here. Like, it's really seen as this major thing, whereas I think that the healthy things to say is, yeah, failure, failure is not trying. Failure is, is surrendering yourself to, to living a boring life. Anything other than that, you should absolutely do it. Right. I always argue that the, you know, it's a little talked about, but our bankruptcy system, which lets companies get rid of debt pretty quickly and processes failure pretty efficiently, is actually a great competitive advantage that we have in the U.S. because it, it gets you in and out, and then you move on to the next thing. Yeah, ab absolutely. And, the, yeah, the personal bankruptcy laws are, are pretty good. The, the corporate banks are, bankruptcy laws are pretty good. There's really very little stigma to failing. You yep. still get invited to the good parties. Um, uh, it's, yeah, I mean, I think that is one of the things that we do that's really healthy is, is this attitude because the, the definition of failure is different. Um, Actually, though, if, if you fail spectacularly, you get invited to slightly less fabulous parties. You'll still get invited to some. Yeah. Not the best. We'll see. Okay. All right, well, first of all, thanks, everybody, so much for coming. Thank you to Luca and Sylvie for assisting and helping out. We'll expect to hear great things from you in the future. And thanks so much, Phil, for all your time and perspective and insight. Uh, I was told to wrap up at 11.35. It's 11.34 and 40 seconds, so let's keep this moving. Got a schedule. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. If, 
if I can still ask you to stay on stage for just a second, we'll see if we have some questions from the audience for you as well. Here, let's see, the most upvoted one was, what kind of user acquisition tactics have you used in the early days of Evernote? Um, well, I don't know about tactics. Uh, you know, what we did is, um, so when we launched, we launched a closed beta. Um, and uh, we had gave away beta codes. This was in, in uh, the spring of 2008. And I think we gave, we gave away the first 100 beta, uh, invite codes on TechCrunch. So okay. TechCrunch wrote an article and gave away the first 100 codes. And after that, it just, you know, it just grew organically. But our main, um, the main way that we got users in the first couple of years is we made a strategy that we would kill ourselves to always have a, the native version of our app be available at every major new device launch and app store launch. And we did it all native. We didn't use HTML5 or anything. And so we spent way more on engineering than we would have had to. But we did it because we wanted to be the showcase application on every major new device and platform. So we would get hundreds of millions of dollars of free marketing from the device companies and the platform companies because they always wanted to have us to show off their new, their new device. And so that, that, was, that was probably our longest term strategy is we just said we will spend much more on development uh, because when you spend that much more on development, you get great products, you actually get a lot of marketing for free. And it worked well for us. Uh, I don't know if uh, maybe that strategy, maybe it's too late to really implement that strategy again because the, the pace of new platforms is probably slowing, uh, but it's what we used early on. But I guess you'd validated already the customer want for your product before you started doing it in <laughs> every possible direction. Yeah, I mean, uh, sure. So people. People, you know, people definitely had a great desire for something like Evernote. It was kind of universally, uh, you know, when, when, when we started working on it, but before we launched it, uh, people would ask me, like, hey, what are you working on? And I would say, well, we're working on this thing called Evernote, and uh, it's going to be a second brain. It's going to make you smarter. It's going to help you remember everything. Mm -hmm. And I probably said this to a few hundred people in, you know, whatever, five, six months before we launched. And every single person I said it to had exactly the same reaction, literally 100% of the time. And it still happens. Like, if someone asked me what's Evernote, and I say... I gave that answer. The, the reaction is always the same. The reaction is always they laugh, yep. and then they say, oh, that's really for me. I could really use that. <laughs> and, I, and I thought, like, that's weird that everyone literally reacts the same way. What does it mean? And I thought, well, when they say, oh, that's for me, I could really use it, that's genuine. Everyone wants this. Everyone wants this, a second brain. And when they laugh, it's because they don't think we can do it. And I thought, like, that's the best place to be as an entrepreneur is, you know, we've got something that has universal demand, and no one thinks we can accomplish it. Like that, yeah. that seemed like exactly the right, you know, okay. the right place to be. Maybe just another quick answer to uh, how do you measure success of your company? What are your KPIs? Uh, well, the, uh, so a couple of things. Um, the key metrics that we really look at is, um, uh, you know, we have various growth metrics, you know, uh, user growth, uh, revenue growth, that kind of stuff. And then we, we are trying really hard now to, to make those specific and tie to specific initiatives, so we, which we haven't done very well in the past. But now, like, if we're going to introduce a new feature, we, we want to set an expectation. We say, well, we expect this new presentation mode to result in this many people using it over this amount of time, and that should bring in you know, this much revenue, and then we, we measure that. But this is new. Like, I can't stand here and say, like, this is what we've always done, mm. um, because we, we haven't. We're just starting to do that now. Uh, we do net promoter score NPS surveys of our customers. So I, I would say if you're only going to do one thing, yeah. the net promoter score is a pretty good indication of, of, of how you're doing, as long as you do it on a regular basis and you, you, compare, the, 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 you, know, you compare the results yeah. over time. Thank you so much, Phil. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, please give a big hand to Phil Levin. <laughs>